Welcome to Mormon Land, a podcast all about the news and culture of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Senior Managing Editor Dave Noyce. I oversee the Salt Lake Tribune's faith coverage. I'm joined by Senior Religion Reporter Peggy Fletcher Stack. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Dave. Before we start, here's a quick ask. We invite you to go to patreon.com where for as little as $3 a month, you can access all of the Tribune's faith coverage, podcast transcripts, and the full Mormon Land newsletter. Again, that's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Mormon Land. And if you haven't already, follow us on Instagram at mormon.land. Now for today's show. For 115 years, the NAACP, the nation's oldest civil rights organization, has been advancing the cause of justice for black Americans. For 111 years, the Anti-Defamation League has been doing much the same for Jewish Americans. And for 104 years, the American Civil Liberties Union has been safeguarding the constitutional rights of everyone in the United States. So which group is protecting advocating and advancing the rights of Latter-day Saints. Well, the Utah Base Face certainly looks out for its own interests and apologetic groups defend church teachings. No independent organization is dedicated to civil rights for Latter-day Saints. It's time to change that, argues Public Square Magazine. In a recent staff editorial, the online publication written from a Latter-day Saint perspective, called for the establishment of a civil rights organization to advocate for the rights of members in, quote, political, legal, and cultural spaces, end quote. Public Square Managing Editor C.D. Cunningham and Associate Editor Brianna Holmes join us today in studio to discuss why such a group is needed, how it could operate, and whom it could benefit. Brianna, C.D., welcome. It's good to be here, David. Glad glad to have you both here. C.D., so let's start with you. Tell our listeners briefly why you wrote this editorial, and did any specific event prompt it? Yeah, well, it's nice to be here. You know, I was I got to be on the show once before Mm -hmm. and I had a wonderful experience and I happen to be here in Salt Lake today. So I'm actually in the studio for the show. We're we're glad you're here. It's nice to be here. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You know, I think this is something that's lived in me a little bit for a long time. Um, I grew up in Southern California and in my little town, there was a little bit of a religion was kind of on the mind, which I think was a little unusual for uh, the early 90s when I was a young boy. And uh, a lot of that religion on the mind wasn't so favorable toward uh, our faith tradition. And I remember coming out one day and seeing written in my dad's car, um, well, if this was Christmas story, it would say fudge the Mormons is what was written hmm. on that on that car. And I think that I mean, I think that was a pretty formative experience. I was about eight or nine when that happened. And it it really signals to you that at least in this space, in this context, you're not welcome here. You're, you're an outsider in this space. We don't like you and your kind. At least that's the way I heard it. And I don't know. There's a lot of other ways to read a message like that. Um, and so. So, yeah, I think it's something that's been there. I think this topic is back kind of on our minds for writing the editorial, um, McKay Coppins, uh, book about Mitt Romney records mm-hmm. a conversation where he had about a group like this. And, um, and so I think that's, that's kind of what got me thinking about it again and what inspired writing the editorial. It was a staff editorial. So there's a group of four of us, mm-hmm. me and, uh, Brianne, uh, and our, uh, editor, Danny Frost and Carol Rice, who's our comms director, uh, but I took the lead on writing this one because it is, it's a subject that's always had some, some passion for me. Brianna, you could probably tell us that. what's been the reaction to the position that public square took and, and it, has there been some pro and con? I would say so. I think, um, there's been some questions about, well, aren't you guys in the majority? Why would you need a, a civil right? Why would you need an organization to advocate for you? But then there's also people within the faith who are very much like, yeah, we need this. We need this representation because uh, CD and I certainly aren't the only ones who've witnessed um, discrimination like that. Mm-hmm. And I suppose that when you're saying the majority, it could be different in different parts of the country, of course. Indeed. Yeah. You know, where Utah is different than Southern California, certainly yeah. different than say Connecticut or whatever. Yeah. So what kind of uh, other religious organizations like this do you look to as a role model? I think, you know, you'd brought up some fantastic organizations in your introduction, some of the most well-known ones. Uh, 
But I think when we think about civil rights organizations, that's often what's in our imagination. And I think that is part of the reason we get questions kind of like what Brand was saying. It's like, well, why, why you, right? Certainly we don't want to have a, you know, a persecution competition, but I don't think that there's any real question that, that there's many groups who are facing much more difficult problems in the U S than Latter-day Saints are. Uh, but I think when you look at this, what surprised me in preparing this was how many groups like this already exist. And so I think a group like the ERLC, which works for the, the Southern Baptist uh, Church, um, you've got groups like the Thomas More Society, which helps advance legal rights for Catholic Americans. Right. These are not groups who are facing particularly egregious uh, discrimination in the United States today either. Uh, and so over and over, I was finding that that these kinds of groups yeah, exist. And so I think groups like that is kind of the model. How are these groups engaging in the public square and looking out for, for the interests of, of their co-religionists? You mean groups that uh, don't seem to have so much overt discrimination like the ADL or... In yeah. other words, you mentioned the Catholics and yeah. the Southern Baptists. Yeah, I think those are, yeah, those are two so that, groups. So the, the group, would, your, uh, your work would be more along those lines. Is that what you're saying? I think a group like this would probably find, find their space there. I think there's a lot of inspiration that all groups who are doing religious civil rights have taken from the Anti-Defamation League. I mean, they're the leaders in the space. They've been doing this for a very long time and... Um, certainly anyone who's thinking about a project like this is going to spend a lot of time looking at them and, and what they're doing and how they've been successful. Um, I, I think there's there's other analogs. For me, my space is a lot of culture um, less than legal. And so I've been very interested in the group GLAD, um, which is a gay and lesbian alliance against defamation, very similar to the ADL. I'm sure they took a lot of their inspiration from them when they started. Uh, and they've done a lot of stuff in TV and media. And I'm like, oh, you know, because for me, looking at kind of the struggles that Latter-day Saints have, a lot of it is in representation uh, in the public square. It is in the cultural cachet. And so I've kind of looked at the work they've done and said, oh, that's really interesting. That could be very effective. I would even add, uh, you said lack of representation. I would say misrepresentation, like very much so. I think when you have Latter-day Saint or more commonly known as Mormon representation, it's usually with a negative connotation. Hmm. Um, So CD brought up uh, legal. Obviously, some some of these groups definitely file lawsuits and that sort of thing. Uh, Do you see part of the role taking legal action against some of these perpetrators or just publicize the issues? You know, I think there are some real legal issues that individual Latter-day Saints face. Uh, And like you mentioned in your introduction, David, the church does a good job of defending itself. Um, But Latter-day Saints and the church aren't synonymous. We go to the church for saving ordinances. We go to the church to worship. Um, But for example, the cases that I'm hearing about and preparing this and talking to people about this are employment discrimination cases, people who are applying for academic jobs and people look at their Facebook and be like, oh, they've they've posted religious content and that being points against them. Um, I'm hearing uh, cases in family law where there'll be a divorce and one person will have left the church and one person will have stayed. And the judge in that case will have discriminatory feelings against Latter-day Saints. And so they'll award custody primarily because they think the children will be better off there because in their estimation, the church is a bad influence. And so it's cases like this that are affecting individuals. One of the big legal issues right now uh, is a case from the last Supreme Court ter- term, uh, Graf versus DeJoyce. Uh, and this was a, a evangelical who joined the post office because it meant he didn't have to work on Sunday. Uh, And so as the post office has evolved, he no longer could get Sundays off and he sued them Uh, and he won. And what they found was that the standard, they called it a de minimis standard that employers would only have to accommodate religion if it basically didn't bother them at all. Now the, the, new ruling found they have to accommodate them as long as it's not an undue burden, which in legal terms is, is more accommodation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so a lot of the cases that I've been hearing about and kind of thinking, Hey, there may be a place for a group like this are new converts to the church who want to get Sundays off of work so they can worship. But 
they don't really know how. This is not a space that that has been explored much. And so because of this this new ruling, it seems like there's some civil rights that Latter-day Saints may have to worship that aren't being fully explored or, mm-hmm. or used yet. So I think there's some legal stuff that can be done. I, we've addressed this a little bit for both of you, though. Uh, 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 We've, we've touched on this at least for a number of these civil rights organizations like the NAACP, they were formed to advocate for people who were and still are persecuted. I think most people still, you know, there's still blatant pl- front page news discrimination that happens. While Latter-day Saints certainly have a history of persecution, you know, in their history, has much of that, dis- hasn't much of that disappeared? Do you think it's still a, a real issue, Brianna? I would say that it's definitely an issue. I don't know that it's necessary. Like I think Chris, um, CD's made very clear um, previously. We're not saying that what m- m- members of the church are experiencing have to compare to what other groups are experiencing, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't shed light on what they are. Um, I think the main thing that comes to mind for me if you're talking about discrimination or persecution, I think immediately almost of the Book of Mormon um, production. That was, it was something that was really welcome and was super popular and also felt incredibly um, alienating, I think, for a lot of members of the church. But if you spoke out against it, it's like, oh, you just can't take a joke. If it had been a different religious group, heck, even a different minority religious group here, there would have been plenty of people who would have had issues with it. Mm -hmm. Um, But because of Latter-day Saints and the history of not speaking out against that type of things, it was an open door for them. I think people applaud the church's response to that, right? The playbill, the book 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 is better. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Good for them. I applaud it too. But I don't think we think about why was that the church's only move, right? Why was the church in a position where they couldn't respond more forcefully, uh, where they couldn't say, you know, some of the jokes you're telling here are not okay, because we can say that. And we've seen with this musical, as tastes have changed over the last, when did it come out, 15 years ago? They said this musical isn't okay because it's offensive to people of color, that this is the group that we're concerned that this uh, is offensive to, and it is, and they should <laughs> rightfully call it out for that uh, reason. But it's interesting that that for the church, they, they didn't have a space where they could say that. I don't think the church has the cultural cachet to really speak up for itself on issues like that. Speaking of McKay Coppins, he, he wrote a brilliant piece in The Atlantic recently about his experience growing up as a Latter-day Saint. And he's the one who used that phrase quite a bit to say he just always felt like he was on the bottom of the ladder and there was kind of this gnawing need for acceptance. (laughs) And so I think part of the reason of having a group like this is just for there to be an entity out there that says, we've got your back. And I think that changes a lot of the ways that Latter-day Saints feel that they can interact with a society around them. So how them. could an organization like this, I'm sorry, how, how could an organization have countered the Book of Mormon musical? I mean, would they have or could they have? Like, can you give me an example of what, it, what an organization like could do? Could do. I think that if you are concerned about a group out there, you are less likely to, to step on some things, right? If someone says something that's offensive, there are groups that will come in and we'll talk to them and you'll see it in their press releases later. You know, so-and-so met with such and such civil rights group from such and such group that they offended. And now they've learned a little better. And that's kind of part of the public reckoning that we often have with public figures is to say they've met with people who care about the feelings of these people and making sure you understand them and their concerns. Well, Um, what would have happened with this musical? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if a group like this would have prevented a musical like this. I don't know if a group like this could have had, you know, a protest that would have been covered by the New York Times. I don't know if it would have totally petered out and the popularity of the music would have, Mm -hmm. you know, rolled right over it. All of those are certainly possible. Um, I think what immediately comes to mind for me is, you know, outside of Utah, outside of, you know, where a lot of Latter-day Saints kind of congregate, there's not a ton of familiarity with the faith. And so for a lot of people outside of um, our religion, this was like a first exposure. 
to mm-hmm. Latter-day Saints and not a great one, <laughs> not a great impression. Uh, and so in some ways, a response to that could have just been having a more accurate representation or just saying, this is not like you know, representative for, of the religion. You know, and, for two years, I was an elder Cunningham. So it was a little bit personal. For me. <laughs> yeah, right. And so just something along those lines of, hey, this is, I don't know not actually what this is about would have gone a long way, I think, because you still have people who this is their only impression of Mormons, the only impression of the church of Jesus Christ. And it is woefully inaccurate. And and the church can fill in that space a little bit, right? They can say this is not it, but the church is an institution. It's an entity with its own sort of needs. And this was also affecting people, you know, it's affecting those kids in schools whose friends have now watched this and have these jokes about their beliefs and things like that. And I think I think that's where I see there's a gap. It's it's how these misunderstandings, how these, you know, discriminatory behaviors are affecting people. Uh, So I'm going to change a little bit. CD, you mentioned employment discrimination. Um, How. Uh, that requires money to file lawsuits or to bring up cases like that. How would your organization have been helpful in, in cases like that? There's, I don't know, right? This is, this is kind of a call out to the world to say, there seems like there's, there's something needed here. There's lots of wonderful social entrepreneurs. I had the chance to be a social entrepreneur and starting this project. It's still something that interests me, but I think there's lots of different people who, who are feeling the need for a group like this right now and feel like it might be the right time. Um, and I think there's lots of different models that could be used in, in creating it um, in terms of funding. Um, funding has never been a part of social entrepreneurship that I've, I've been particularly interested in. Fun, <laughs> fun, fundraising is not my favorite thing. My, my condolences to you guys that it's now part of, I don't know how much you guys need to do it yourselves. Luckily, but. that's not what we have to do that much either. Uh, so, yeah. But uh, filing lawsuits is costly. It is. It is expensive. Absolutely is, yeah. Uh, and I think a group like this would probably want to start um, by filing amicus briefs. Um, where you're able to, to put in friends of the court um, arguments. These are things that, you know, established lawyers can write pretty quickly, but they can also establish a sense of, hey, these are the things that matter to us. You start to build friendships. You, you write them for other groups who are in similar positions and start to build kind of interfaith coalitions. And a lot of groups like that are out there. And I don't know that we ended up talking about this in the editorial, but I feel like there's lots of friends out there who would welcome a Latter-day Saints specific civil rights group to enter their space and to mm-hmm. to speak up, not just for themselves, but as we speak up for ourselves to speak up for for them and where our, mm-hmm. our things meet. As some of those shared values, yeah. I think, has been something that we've noticed, just wanting to create bridges in that. Yeah. So. You note, I believe, in the piece, uh, maybe for both of you, uh, the, the persecution that we've been taught or these kind of doesn't have to be a requirement for such a group. So so how, how else could a group like this benefit Latter-day Saints? I would say just for me personally, how I see it is just spreading an awareness. I think there's and going to school with people who are unfamiliar with Latter-day Saints and living in different states outside of Utah, being in different countries. There's just not a lot of understanding. Uh, And so creating an environment where it's not necessarily proselyting, but just informative, I think would be helpful. Um, I gave a presentation in my grad school um, experience just talking about Latter-day Saints and the culture and the religion, just very informative, not proselyting, but just talking about, hey, this is what the religious experience is like, and this is what the beliefs are, and this is how it's organized. And so when somebody says, oh, they had a mission companion, you know what that means, right? You understand the culture around it. And when they say, I want to get married in the temple, you understand the significance of that to them individually. And so being able to just facilitate understanding, I think would be a really cool thing that this organization could potentially do. And I think for for news media organizations, too, I think um, 
I think one space that a group like this could fill is, was it in 2019, I think, that there was the the whistleblower. Uh, the Washington Post broke the story about the Enzyme Peak Fund. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the report that was sent into it had uh, several references to tapirs, um, which is a symbol of anti-Mormonism on the internet. Um, it's a little bit of a joke. They're making fun of Dan Peterson, uh, who made an argument that that might be what horses meant in the Book of Mormon translation, and they don't particularly care for that argument. And so Tapiris has become a little bit of an icon. And if you look at like the ex-Mormon subreddit, like that's literally the icon on there as a picture of a tapir. And so reading this as someone in the know who understands this Latter-day Saint space, I could immediately recognize this document as being motivated in part by anti-Mormon animus, right? The person who wrote this has this dog whistle uh, about tapirs that people will hear who share their sentiments. And yet that was not reported by a single uh, media outlet so far as as I know. The Washington Post left it out of theirs. Was there... um, was a religion dispatches that, that published it with them. Uh, and so, so something like that, I mean, it's a little bit of a niche, uh, a niche thing. I mean, it's a, a dog whistle, literally only certain people are meant to be able to hear and understand that. So the implication is that the media didn't know and they an organization know. like this could have at least pointed but that out. Isn't that out. the role of the church PR department itself? And the church does have PR reps in all stakes, in all regions, the 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 informing of the public does seem mm-hmm. like a church role, not an independent role. Am I wrong about that? You know, the church is a religious organization. It's not a civil rights organization. And but I think cor- correcting misinformation is definitely something the church does. Oh, for sure. Yeah. The church PR does. Yeah. But I don't think it's necessarily wise or appropriate for the church to be reaching out to say, hey, you've missed this angle on your story. Oh, I had wish you had thrown this in. I mean, you probably work with church PR you more get than that anyone. all the time. Do you? Where they're, all they're the adding time. things to the story. <laughs> Do you feel like the institution somehow is handcuffed in a way that they can't do some of those things? I wouldn't describe it as handcuffed, okay. but I would say that because of the uh, institutional structure and because of their need to represent Jesus Christ on earth to the people who are there, that there are ways that um, people engage in the public square in terms of correction and information that they that they wouldn't do, but that there's a space, an appropriate space for. Uh, So your editorial says, quote, the lack of a Latter-day Saint civil rights organization has had a negative effect in many arenas of public life. How do you mean that? I am not as well informed as the CD on like the legal ramifications um, or those other things. You know, he took kind of the lead on this one, as he said earlier. But from my personal perspective, I think what you said previously was, isn't that the role of the church? Misinformation, understanding that. The church PR department. Church PR department, right? Yeah. And also, um, I think just by nature of being directly associated with the religion, it can be maybe perceived as proselyting or trying to get people on their side or whatever, rather than maybe just being seen as informational. Right. It, there's something to be said about just having someone that can speak to the culture, the intent and these things like uh, tap, you say tapir, tapirs, yeah, the tapir, yeah. <laughs> tapirs. I think there's other things that we can speak to. Right. But just um, being able to address those issues would be awesome. I think we wrote another article. I think you wrote the article um, about the New York Times after general conference and how it just felt woefully misrepresented in. It was an Associated Press article. Yes. Yeah. And and sure, like the church could address that. Maybe they could talk about it, but maybe not as effective as a different organization talking about it. And like I mentioned earlier, there, there is a distinction between the church and Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints love the church and the church loves Latter-day Saints, right? There, there's a, there, there's a real close relationship there, but they're not synonymous, right? The, 
the church with all of its institutional strength would probably be inappropriate stepping into something like a, a family court battle. But for someone to say, but my religious freedom has been hurt, I think there is a place for a group to come in and say, hey, there is a good religious argument to be had here. It's not the church's place to make this argument, but it is a place for someone to make this argument. So, and that kind of leads to one of my questions that, that you, I think, close the editorial on. How could a Latter-day Saint civil rights group help in the areas your editorial spells out? The political, legal, and cultural spaces. You highlighted cultural a little earlier, yeah. CD. Like in those spaces, we've probably yeah. touched on some of this. I realize Maybe already uh, how, 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 how could this type of civil rights group help in those arenas? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it sounds like it's very much might be legal, might be advocacy, might be educational. Um, are, are those areas you think Latter-day Saints just aren't represented in or their views aren't represented in? Yeah, I think that's. That's what what we're saying. Not that they're totally shut out, not that there's any systemic idea that we're going to leave them out. But but again, like what I started with with this editorial is so many of these uh, organizations have a group like this. And it's very unusual for a a group the size of Latter-day Saints uh, with our position in society to not have a group representing them like this. And so. In discovering that, it, it kind of changed the question for me less from, well, why do we need one? Uh, how will this help to be like, well, why don't we have them? Uh, how, how might it, you know, how might have things been different if we had them? Uh, and I think we do see a lot of places as a discouragement, right? As someone knowing, oh, if I discriminate in X, Y, Z way, there's going to be some uh, likely to be some legal repercussions because there's this this group who's known, who stands up for these issues. Um Let's see. I had an interesting conversation with one of your colleagues, um, mm-hmm. Tamara. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, when I, I first talked to her, I, called, I said uh, Tamara. So I was really wrong the first time. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, anyway, she had written an article about uh, about temples being built. I live in Las Vegas. And so it crossed my path because she had written about that. And the main source on her story uh, complained about being called a bigot. Um, by Latter-day Saints online and uh, I guess from Vegas. And I was a little surprised that she had not asked her about the petition uh, that was opposing the temple because the petition had a list of reasons for signing. And among the reasons for signing were things like go back to Utah or keep your religion out of our city or we don't want your cult here. And repeatedly, she was asked to denounce these words on this petition, and she declined over and over and over again. And now she's doing this interview saying, why is anyone calling me a bigot? And I'm like, well, I wonder why. Um, And and we missed that angle. Now, I'm just a guy who, you know, editorialist, so I could reach out to to her and say, hey, I think you missed an angle here that might have been juicier. Um, But I, I, I think a more... Uh, an organization that's more focused on that could do good work with journalists and pointing them to some of these issues where, where Latter-day Saints do struggle right now. When we look at media coverage, uh, the church and consequently Latter-day Saints are usually seen as in a position of power. Uh, And certainly that's sometimes true. I mean, that's kind of the whole raison d'etre of the tribune is treating the church as a, as a place of power and holding that power to account. But especially across the country, it's just not that way in a lot of places. And so I think we do miss miss those angles. So let's talk for a second about funding. We raised that. Do you worry that seeking funding for a group like this could turn it into be more politicized? That seems like a question for someone seeking funding for a group like this. Uh, you know, that's the nice thing about writing editorials. I, I don't know that I, I need to think about the specifics. I, I think there's lots of mistakes that could be made in creating a group like this. And I think anyone who tries to undertake it is going to need to be very careful of avoiding those mistakes. And I think, um, I mean, I think definitely some of the other groups are perceived in a political way. Yeah, I mean, certainly. Definitely. It's, it's not a death now. I mean, you know, but but I think it can become too political 
there's a lot of people in the religious freedom space um, who are able to rise a little bit above that. You were asking earlier about inspirations and they're not a demographic specific one. So I didn't bring them up, but the Beckett Foundation has been one that I've really spent a lot of time looking at and they do as politicized as religious freedom has become, they kind of rise, rise above that. And they're not seen as necessarily right uh, or left. And I I think they've been a good model of how, how to avoid something like that. A, A final question for both of you. What would you tell opponents? And there are some, of founding such a group for Latter-day Saints. What, 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 what would you tell them? What would you counter to them? Uh, Brianna, do you want to start? I think it would depend on what specifically they're wanting to counter. If it's mm-hmm. the need for it, I think CD and I have talked at length about a need for it. If it's the politis, uh, the potential politicization of it, um, that's another argument. I mean, I think what we're really getting at is wanting an organization that can reflect the values of the gospel of Jesus Christ in a more public sphere in a way that helps with representation and helps facilitate positive discourse um, around issues such as we've talked about throughout this podcast. Mm -hmm. CD. So in Myanmar, uh, they have a, a Buddhist nationalist government right now. And the Rohingya Muslim population there is dealing with some struggles. Um, And I imagine someone across the border in Bangladesh, where they have a strong Muslim majority, uh, and there is a persecuted Buddhist minority in the Chittagong area there, saying, "Why, why would you need a group protecting the civil rights of... Uh, The Rohingya Muslims, they're in charge in Bangladesh, where they're speaking from. And I think when I I hear concerns of people who are concerned that a group like this might um, further hurt people who feel like they've been hurt by the church, that's largely the, the perspective they're coming from. They're coming from the perspective where they are feeling alienated and they are looking at other people who are feeling alienated and say, well, you shouldn't because where I am at, people like you are doing just fine. And that's where I'm seeing a lot of the the concern, a lot of um, the pushback coming from. And so I think stories like like that, that example are, are the way to, to respond to that. Um, you know, after being in Southern California, I lived in Texas for 20 years. It was a wonderful time, but... But opinions about my faith in Texas were very different than they are across the street at Temple Square. Um, And it's not unusual to get a sideways glance. And you're lucky if that's the worst you ever get. Um, So I think when we talk about a national civil rights organization for Latter-day Saints, it's just important to put it in that, that broader perspective. Sometimes here in Utah, we can get a little focused on, on Utah and Utah politics and, um, those are important conversations. I've never lived in Utah. It's not really my conversation. It's it's a little bit more national in scope. And on a national scope, we're a religious minority, and we deal with some some real difficulties. Certainly not as bad as as everyone out there. We're not at the bottom of the the picking order, but uh, but real real struggles that deserve to be respected and heard. Hmm. Brianna Holmes, C D Cunningham. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thanks, thanks, thanks to Peggy. David, I appreciate it. And thanks to Peggy Fletcher. Stack. Always a pleasure. And to our producer, Chris Samuels, where we remind you that you can keep up on all the happenings in and about the church by subscribing to the Salt Lake Tribune's free Mormon Land newsletter. Just go to sltrib.com to sign up and we'll talk again next time on Mormon Land. Mm-hmm.